this record. Uh, so this uh, will be recorded and then um, as always, uh, uh, within two or three days after the webinar, we'll um, send you the PowerPoint slides from the presentation today. Actually, we'll send uh, kind of the, found the article that I used as the basis for this presentation, which was pretty hot off the press, and, um, yeah, and links, of course, to uh, be able to listen to uh, the recording itself that you can share with, with other people. And that will get posted on our website as well. So I'm going to um, minimize this, but feel free if you have um, questions as we go through um, our presentation today um, to uh, yeah, unmute yourself and, and interrupt me and ask a question or type something in the chat box and uh, let me know. Um, so, and I'll certainly ask for your, uh, your uh, experiences as we uh, discuss some of this. So, um, all right, let me get my mouse working. All right, so my first uh, fun task is to introduce uh, Sarah Bellotti, who is our new uh, staff assistant. She just started couple of weeks ago, maybe. This is my third week. <laughs> she's in her third week with us, and she's still here. <laughs> As we haven't totally under overwhelmed her. Oh, good, Christy, I see you're with OSU. Great. Um, and um, anyway, she um, was already employed here on the Health Science Center campus and comes from the Office of Medical Education, where she coordinated some pretty significant projects for that, uh, that office. Um, she has a uh, one master's already from Oklahoma City University and is working on another master's from um, from OU itself. And of course, um, uh, has two cute Welsh corgis there, So, which she actually told me they have their own Facebook page, uh, so I won't get into all of that. But anyway, <laughs> uh, we've uh, enjoyed getting her uh, on board with our team. So you'll be getting, uh, at times, um, more uh, communications and emails um, from Sarah on our behalf as she helps get our house in order. So welcome to Sarah. All right, well, our topic today, of course, is evidence-based care during the golden hour. So our objectives for today, we're gonna review the concept of the golden hour and kind of where that term comes from. We're gonna then review current baby-friendly USA uh, criteria for step four, um, which uh, covers the golden hour and then current evidence for some of these golden hour practices. And then we're gonna discuss a, a sample golden hour protocol that came um, from this uh, article. So the um, term golden hour, at least as it applies to uh, perinatal uh, healthcare, it came, is, is believed to have originated with Michael Odent, um, who was a French obstetrician and uh, back in 1977 that he described, of course, the behavior of newborns um, if they're not separated, if they're put in immediate skin-to-skin -skin contact and left um, undisturbed, that they will uh, seek the breast in the first hour of life. Um, of course, uh, uh, we also know that uh, the golden hour is used in other aspects of healthcare, particularly related to trauma, which is where um, the term originally came from. So I understand there's some debate um, now in the field as to um, kind of the timing uh, of the golden hour, because in some instances for trauma patients, maybe it's the golden five minutes or 10 minutes, or it doesn't maybe need to be an hour that, uh, depending on the uh, injuries. But that was also a term that's been used um, in the military as well in, on the battlefield and looking at you know, what's the time frame for maximum survival um, of injured soldiers in the field. So it was really interesting to kind of look some of that up. But of course, for our purposes today, we're looking at um, uh, the uh, first hour of life for newborns. Um, so um, we're going to look at some key, what they describe as key golden hour elements, and that's skin-to-skin uh, -skin contact, delayed cord clamping, of course, breastfeeding, initiation of breastfeeding, um, uh, unless the mother you know, has chosen not to. And then, in particular, of course, delaying non-urgent tasks so that we don't interfere with um, the skin-to-skin uh, -skin contact and um, that initiation of breastfeeding. So, um, <clears throat> so let's just um, review. Uh, for those of you that are working on uh, Baby Friendly, um, you'll be very familiar uh, or somewhat familiar with these uh, 
with these criteria, but we just want to review these today so we can see that we're pretty much in sync between what Baby Friendly USA says about that first hour uh, of life for the newborn and then what we're going to talk about as, as the golden hour. So, so officially step four, uh, the short version is help mothers initiate breastfeeding within one hour of birth. And as many of y'all know, there are multiple bullet points under that. Um, uh, under that step, and um, but the expanded version of step four, or the more detailed description of step four, is place infants in skin-to-skin -skin contact with their mothers immediately following birth for at least an hour, and encourage mothers to recognize when their infants are ready to breastfeed, offering help uh, if needed. So in, um, in more specifics on this, of course, all mothers should be given their infants to hold with uninterrupted and continuous skin-to-skin -skin contact immediately after birth and until completion of the first feeding. So uh, in most healthy babies, as, as many of y'all I'm sure have experienced, are going to um, uh, seek the breast and, and attach and feed within that first hour. But certainly if a baby hasn't fed yet, um, and we're monitoring, um, of course, always continue monitoring um, uh, the newborn and the mother, but uh, we certainly would leave them. So Nancy says she can't hear anything. Is everybody else, um, uh, I think everybody else was able to hear. Uh, so just let me just do a sound check. Is there anybody else that can't hear? Um, yeah, we had several people that were commenting earlier. So I don't know, Nancy, if you need to, um, yeah, call in on the, oh, right, right. Well, she, oh, right, thank you, if Nancy can't hear. Um, let me just type real quick. Uh, so, uh, let me move that out of the way. Uh, anyway, so, um, so mothers should be given babies to hold uninterrupted, continuous, um, Unless, of course, you know, there's a medical complication in either the mother or the baby. So point number two is that routine procedures, such as assessing the baby, at birth scores, et cetera, um, should be done while the baby is skin to skin with the mother. So those aren't reasons to delay or interrupt skin to skin contact. Um, and then procedures that do require separation uh, such as bathing the baby, of course, uh, should be delayed until, um, it, particularly until that first skin-to-skin -skin period um, has uh, concluded, and you know, ideally at the mother's bedside. So something important like the bath, the mother can uh, participate in as well. And then last but not least, I think, is that skin-to-skin -skin contact should be encouraged throughout the hospital stay. Um, so I'm going to pause here and just um, ask uh, those of you that we have um, on the call today, um, how, what would you say? Would you say this is happening um, uh, most of the time, say with vaginal deliveries um, in your facility? Um, or anybody see any, um, wanna share if any challenges in making this happen in your hospital? is Linda, and we do do skin to skin pretty regularly. Occasionally it won't happen, but uh, usually with a vag delivery, we do skin to skin. Great. What we find is that the skin to skin with the mother is great, but then uh, somebody else wants to hold it, and you know you have family in, and so it doesn't it doesn't do that continuous skin to skin necessarily for the first hour. Right. Right. We'll talk about that. That's a great example of one of the challenges. Um, Absolutely, is dealing um, with the family. So, oh, and then Christy's typing that OSU is doing skin to skin with badge um, and C sections. Yeah. So, um, great. Uh, so, let me, because I do have, there are a few points. Uh, of course, we don't want to leave out the mothers that have cesarean sections. Um, but here's just, this is an example of um, a mom whose baby is skin to skin, and then there's the nurse getting ready to um, do her assessment um, for some monitoring of the baby. Now, and normally, of course, if, when we're not getting ready to assess the baby, you could have the mother and the baby covered with a loose blanket um, for privacy and um, uh, warmth, of course. 
So, um, all right, so then of course, specifically for cesarean births, mothers and babies should be placed in continuous uninterrupted skin-to-skin -skin contact as soon as the mother is responsive and alert. Um, and with the same <clears throat> support mentioned before about helping the mother recognize feeding cues and offer um, help with that first feeding as needed. Um, and then once again, of course, unless separation is medically indicated. So, um, and then if there is a medical reason, uh, and I know we've had some facilities when they were um, undergoing their baby friendly assessment, um, maybe get a bit surprised uh, on this point is if there was a documented medical reason for skin to skin contact not happening, then did we document when did we actually initiate skin to skin contact and did we try to get the baby skin to skin with the mother as soon as possible? Um, and of course it's all about, you know, what gets documented in the medical record too. So, um, so anybody, any comments, um, challenges? Uh, so I know some are working on skin to skin in the, uh, in the OR or the PACU, um, but other um, comments, and we heard that OSU is doing it um, in both places. Nancy, I hope you can uh, hear now. So, um, but feel free to uh, unmute and share any other experiences. So that's uh, Baby Friendly USA guidelines. Um, I keep forgetting to change my mouse. Okay, um, and then and here you see some examples of um, the baby in the upper left is um, less than an hour old, already latched on uh, in the PACU after a cesarean, and then here's the baby and mom still you know in the OR. And we've got the baby right up there um, with mom and dad. So um, and we'll talk a little bit more about when we get to our uh, protocol uh, examples. So. Um, Anyway, and then the official definition of skin-to-skin -skin contact um, is uh, 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 skin-to-skin -skin care, skin-to-skin -skin contact, refers to contact between the baby and the mother. And if um, the mother is not available for whatever reason, if we do have a medical complication with mom, then we can have another adult such as dad or even a grandparent um, hold the baby skin-to-skin -skin so that newborn is still getting skin to skin contact with someone which is helping you know with that uh, transition um, and so uh, but after birth the baby is completely dried and placed naked against the mother's um, naked ventral surface so um, all right is that hopefully everybody so that's where we are with um, baby friendly um, and they do say, of course, we can have a diaper um, and a hat, but there shouldn't be any other clothing between the mom and baby. And then cover them both with a warm blanket, keeping baby's head uncovered. And once again, skin to skin should be encouraged beyond those first hours and into the you know, first days after birth and, and beyond. So, so I think that's just some reminders to staff too, to um, encourage it when, um, when mom and baby are just recovering postpartum or on your mother baby unit, they're getting ready to go home, you know, remind them they can still um, continue some of that daily skin to skin contact. Um, and of course, this is where we can get dad involved as well. So um, this was actually a, a, <clears throat> a husband of one of the nurses at OU from a few years ago. And I just remember it was so um, it was so fun to hear her uh, complain about um, how much her husband loved doing skin-to-skin -skin contact with the baby. In fact, that she hardly ever got the baby except to breastfeed because dad was always holding the baby. So um, we definitely can get dads involved in bonding um, with the skin-to-skin -skin contact. So, all right, well, let's then um, look at uh, what does the evidence say about these golden hour practices that I mentioned um, earlier uh, on the earlier slides. So, well, we uh, can look at impact on the baby. Um, and uh, some of this I know um, y'all know. And one of the things I've done as well um, is uh, I've tried to uh, cite some uh, key references, but all of the references that I've um, cited are also in the article that I pulled a lot of this because um, this was just such a good summary article of the topic. And so you will uh, have easy access to uh, any of those references as well. And we send you the, 
the article itself. Um, so anyway, so we know that the um, impact on the baby, of course, we're going to see decreased risk of uh, hypothermia, hypoglycemia. Uh, it's going to stabilize the respiratory rate and blood pressure for the baby. Uh, it's going to decrease newborn stress hormones. Uh, of course, that extended skin-to-skin -skin contact um, uh, is going to support optimal brain development. And then, you know, this was an interesting fact as well. I mean, we know that both the mother and the baby um, have high oxytocin levels while they're in skin-to-skin -skin contact. Um, but uh, the oxytocin can also help protect the newborn, you know, from, well, it, it decreases the stress hormone, so it helps really um, protect the baby from any um, later, you know, sudden separation from the mother where the baby can actually exhibit symptoms similar to, um, you know, drug withdrawal. So, so that was really an interesting um, detail that they included in there. Um, and then, of course, we, we've known for a long time that um, keeping the mother and baby together in that early um, contact is also going to increase breastfeeding um, exclusivity and duration. So, um, and, and ultimately for both mom and baby, of course, is bonding. Um, so um, we know that when babies are in um, skin to skin contact, particularly that uh, they'll have more time in the quiet alert state. So if you think about new moms being anxious about managing um, their baby and, and starting off this breastfeeding stuff, if the baby's not crying as much and is in that quiet alert state, that that certainly is going to facilitate uh, early breastfeeding and boost mom's confidence as well. So, so we see improved interactions um, between the mother and the baby. And then, um, uh, and we've known this as well, that um, the longer the baby stays, especially in that initial skin-to-skin -skin, uh, contact period, uh, that uh, the uh, longer, um, the greater the impact it has on breastfeeding duration. So, uh, so if they, you know, approach that hour of skin-to-skin -skin contact, then we're going to see a, a higher percentage of babies that are breastfeeding at three months. Um, so a, a dose-dependent relationship, definitely, between skin-to-skin -skin contact and breastfeeding. Um, all right, so let's look at the mother. Um, well, once again... Mom has, um, oh, does somebody want to say something? Anybody? If anybody has any questions, feel free to, um, yeah, to interrupt me or type um, in the chat box, too. So anyway, so we know that the mother um, uh, has uh, uh, high oxytocin levels and skin-to-skin -skin contact uh, continues to uh, increase those or keep those levels higher. And so because of that, we'll um, tend to see less uh, postpartum bleeding, which can decrease her risk for postpartum hemorrhage, more rapid delivery of the placenta and uterine involution, all good for maternal health. Um, once again, it's going to decrease maternal anxiety, build, boost mom's confidence in her parenting skills, of course, the impact on breastfeeding again, and ultimately um, increase maternal satisfaction. So, uh, so several um, references there to uh, cover all of those um, those facts, and then once again um, the uh, bonding. Yeah. Change my mouse. Okay. Um, so uh, who is at risk of actually not getting skin to skin contact? Um, so the mothers um, that were cited in this um, uh, Bureau Yelland and Brown um, publication in particular. Uh, found that the mothers who were less likely to have skin-to-skin -skin contact were more likely to be your primates, of course, your higher-risk pregnancies, and then um, a surgical birth. So if mom um, had had a cesarean or vacuum extraction or something, that those mothers were less likely to have skin-to-skin -skin contact. Um, so this is actually a box that I uh, took out of the article um, that listed um, characteristics associated with greater likelihood. So once again, you can see um, multiplicity, low-risk pregnancy, and so forth. But also, if they received midwifery care as opposed to physician babies as well. So, um, all right. Well, what's the impact of increased breastfeeding duration? So this would be some of the other evidence um, for the golden hour practices. Of course, I think um, everyone on the call today is going to be familiar with overall health impact, but just to 
recap briefly. Um, this was from a, a publication that Melissa Bartik and huge team of co-authors published last year. Um, and you know, side in this was a really lovely infographic that they made, um, where they they took um, the uh, uh, impact. Whoops, shouldn't be um, doing that. Anyway, the impact on maternal health, and of course related to breast cancer, diabetes, heart attacks, hypertension, and so forth, and calculating the cost to the healthcare system, and then also um, the impact on um, maternal um, disease and mortality. And then, of course, looked at it uh, on the baby side as well. So you can see um, what's what was interesting is to realize um, when you look at uh, impact on, say, for example, um, you know, hypertension and breast cancer and so forth. You know that, that those do lead to increased uh, mortality in women, and uh, even more so than um, uh, what we see in the baby. So. Um, Anyway, so you can see certainly um, many of these that we're <clears throat> very familiar with. Um, and so overall, their summary was, you know, that if we supported and enabled as a society optimal breastfeeding, um, that we would actually prevent that, that 2,600 maternal deaths and 700 child deaths um, each year. Or so, and that was the publication uh, in Maternal Child Nutrition from uh, from last year. Or so. Oh, I think I had those slides on a slideshow thing or something. That's why they're doing that. All right, so we're going to switch gears now then and talk about a sample golden hour protocol. And this is um, the article that uh, I pulled a lot of this information from, providing evidence-based care during the golden hour. It just came out in the uh, latest uh, uh, it, latest issue of Nursing for Women's Health, which is... Uh, uh, A1's um, uh, other kind of clinical practice journal, if you will, uh, as opposed to Joggin. So really, really nice article. So once again, the key golden hour elements that we're going to look at, delayed cord clamping, skin to skin, breastfeeding, and delay of non-urgent task. Um, so in their protocol, I'm looking at delayed cord clamping. Now, of course, this is getting out of my area. I'm not a labor and delivery nurse by any means. Um, and uh, that uh, there's certainly a, a, a more consensus, I think, that we're seeing in the OB community uh, about delayed cord clamping. So that was a question I had for the um, people that are on the webinar today, is um, how many of you are actually um, either doing delaying cord clamping or working to um, implement that practice? So anybody? Um, that wants to uh, comment on that or share on that, I would be very curious. We at Ada have done the delayed cord clamping for several years, actually, um, but they are being a little more adamant about it, particularly a particular obstetrician. Um, wait till the cord quits pulsing. So, so you have a particular obstetrician that's more adamant not to do it or to do it. To do it, there are times the nurses are a little uh, concerned about it because we see some difficulties with the infant that we think needs to be checked out sooner, and he's still not giving giving us the baby because he is still working with the delayed cord clamping. Okay, okay. Does he do, um, you know, or anybody said like because I've read about the milking the cord if it's in a situation where you can't do the delay because you need to you, you do need to um, resuscitate the baby or examine the baby or something um, does it does he he or she do that or talk about that um he has never talked about it something was said and, and my memory doesn't last that long but something was said at one time about milking it and he he uh, way i understood him was that he did not think that that was the best way to get the core of the blood in there so he didn't do the milking well, because I looked up the um, ACOG um, protocol, which just came out last year. Uh, so they actually have a protocol policy statement, whatever, position statement or something on delayed cord clamping. And um, uh, so because uh, I was trying to find out no one, um, as you see on my slide here, the American College of Nurse Midwives, you know, recommended some, you know, specific time frames um, depending on 
if it's a term uh, baby as opposed to a preterm, but I didn't find any definition from anyone of what preterm uh, is <laughs> when, when they are too preterm to do that. So um, probably evaluated on a, um, yeah, maybe certainly your late preemies could do that. But they did talk about, um, and that was in the ACOG publication as well, about um, milking the cord when you, you know, if you could do something for 10 or 15 seconds, but not for two or three minutes. Um, so that that was certainly another option, though. They still needed more, um, more good evidence to support that practice. But they were suggesting that as, as an option. Um, so anyway, so as you can see here, um, the World Health Organization recommends um, clamping you know, one to three minutes. The uh, nurse midwives recommend five, after five minutes for term newborns or two minutes if the baby's placed you know, lower down. Um, and then, you know, if we could get at least 30 seconds um, for a preterm newborn, that that's um, beneficial to those babies. Um, so some of I believe the, um, the current NRP guidelines, um, they're really talking, you know, on your preterm, um, if baby is doing well enough that you can do it for the 30 to 60 seconds. But really those 32 week and below, especially the 28 weekers, they those are the ones they um, acted like just to take to the warmer, of course. But so I think when they're talking preterm, it's more of the 32 to 36 weekers. Yeah. And it's also um, the NRP, they don't have any recommendations for the milking just because there's not enough evidence there. Okay. 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 Thanks for sharing that. Cause I, yeah, like I said, I tried to, I figured there was yeah. some somewhere in the, the above 30 weeks, range of you know that that you could still possibly that you would consider it possibility if the baby was fairly stable but um yes and they really push for that because i mean they say those are the babies that need it the most so even if you can get 30 to 60 seconds it is very beneficial that i can imagine that seems like a really long time too yeah, it is. <laughs> i can't imagine actually so um anyway well thank you for sharing that um you're welcome so uh Anyway, um, so what we do know, um, and this is from uh, ACOG and, uh, of course, the nurse midwives and then another publication I've cited, um, is that uh, the delayed cord clamping allows, of course, for that um, placental transfusion. So we, we kind of, um, you know, perk the baby up a bit more and uh, can increase the birth weight. We'll see greater iron stores at six months of age and it can decrease the need for neonatal blood transfusion. And then, of course, particularly for our um, for those preterm babies, as you said, it uh, can decrease the risk of ne necrotizing enterocolitis, um, iron deficiency, anemia, and then the um, IVH. So, so absolutely, um, and, and that's the that's the the challenge, right? Is the babies who would most benefit from it are the ones that were most anxious um, to whisk them off and and not give time for that. So, um, okay, so. What about um, if the mother is um, HIV positive or hepatitis B positive? Um, uh, oh, and I see, um, looks like um, Great Plains um, does delay cord clamping, um, but they, they stop at about 60 seconds. So, um, so thank you for that. Um, anyway, so with uh, maternal HIV or, or uh, uh, Hep B, the current World Health Organization guidelines um, state that the proven benefits of cord clamping outweigh the theoretical risk of HIV transmission from delaying the cord clamping. And, um, and they say that the research doesn't show that that extra couple of minutes of placental blood flow have been shown to increase the risk of HIV transmission. So, um, but of course, the exception to that would be newborns in need of immediate resuscitation, as always. And then after um, uh, we have delayed the cord clamping with either HIV or hepatitis B, then we do want to bathe the baby right away. So this is one instance where we would take the baby to um, bathe them and then return as soon as possible to mom for skin to skin contact. So yeah, so how does that translate into um, what y'all are uh, doing in your facilities if you have particularly the mom with HIV? Um, does that correlate with kind of the practice y'all are doing, or is that in conflict? Anyone want 
want to share. Anybody had an HIV positive <laughs> recently? <Has anyone? laughs> so, um, so we'll, we will, maybe that's not a controversial issue. We'll move on. Somebody can pipe in if they want to. Um, and then, of course, um, the other, uh, so this is once again, um, so we talked about delayed cord clamping for the protocol, and then, of course, immediate skin-to-skin -skin contact, which we've you know, defined and shared baby-friendly guidelines already. So once again, we're going to put the, um, the dried yet unclosed baby right on mom's chest or abdomen, no routine bulb suctioning, and use, we can use a dry towel to you know, wipe away any secretions that would um, possibly uh, yeah, interfere with the baby's breathing. So, um, and then in particular, delaying the non-urgent tasks so that we aren't maybe doing skin-to-skin -skin contact for five or ten minutes, and then now we got to do all these things. So, um, so we can perform the assessment on the mother's abdomen and postpone weighing and bathing for at least that first hour. So the goal is that we have that uninterrupted bonding time. Um, so. It, so those of you that have been doing skin-to-skin -skin contact, um, and would you say that this is happening, um, that that works? Has everyone gotten comfortable with delaying, or um, is there still pressure maybe to get the baby's weight right away? I know that's mm -hmm. often one that um, we'll hear about. Our doctors would prefer the weight right away. However, it doesn't usually work well that for that with us so yeah we we usually have the one to two hours of the the bonding time with the mother oh good excellent excellent so um and i'll talk about um some barriers um to doing some of these things as well so um so what's wrong with this picture this is a baby less than an hour old already latched at breast but we're not really skin to skin all right we still swaddled them up in the blanket <laughs> So, um, so definitely room for improvement uh, in that. Um, so anyway, and then of course the last. Um, oh, and Christy says it's the parents who want the weight more than anybody else at OSU. <laughs> so that gets back to uh, yeah, family education, doesn't it? Um, we seem like everything always comes back to how much prenatal education can we uh, uh, can we get in? So. Um, Anyway, so the, the final piece, of course, is initiating breastfeeding, and once again, help mom recognize early feeding cues, offer help as needed, um, and then ideally complete that first feeding before we even consider removing the baby from skin-to-skin -skin contact. So, um, all right. So when might we need to postpone? Um, some of these golden hour practices, um, or maybe modify it, or not do it at all. Um, so certainly for the mother, um, if she's had, you know, uh, just recently had opioids and she's not, you know, coherent or cognizant enough, awake enough, um, so uh, that that's not going to be safe for the baby. Uh, if she's having extensive repair of some lacerations, um, maybe extreme maternal exhaustion, uh, of course, you know, the thing we always have to keep in mind, too, is if we're talking about um, in most normal deliveries, um, if every time we document, you know, well, the mother was too exhausted to do skin to skin or do, you know, allow the golden hour or whatever, okay, something else is going on here because it can't be every single mother. So this, these should be, you know, kind of outside, um, these should be outliers uh, and not something that's happening, happening every day. Um, so, uh, and then of course, you know, any kind of maternal um, medical complication, postpartum hemorrhage or any other kind of uh, maternal emergencies. So a few more um, exclusions that might happen, of course, with the baby. So extreme preterm birth, um, and they actually define that as less than 34 weeks. Um, though, depending on the baby, it sounds like, you know, we still want to um, delay cord clamping and can we do some skin to skin contact for a little bit in there. Um, certainly, if the baby's having any respiratory distress or cyanosis, uh, any kind of infection risk that's been identified, or congenital anomalies in the baby that could lead to, um, you know, breathing, um, respiratory or you know, cardiac issues, 
And then um, do we have any perinatal depression signs in the baby, such as apnea, radi bradycardia? And of course, um, uh, as they um, very specifically said, birth of a non-vigorous neonate, uh, and we have meconium stained and amniotic fluid. So those would certainly all be times where, but, for, but if we can stabilize the baby and then put the baby um, you know, back with the mother, uh, then that would be ideal. So, um, and um, the authors in this article also made a, you know, an interesting point of skin-to-skin uh, -skin contact for those, um, you know, SGA babies. If they're less than 2,000 grams, that that significantly reduces mortality in low and middle-income countries. So, maybe we need a separate golden hour protocol for high-risk babies. Of how, what are the pieces of that that we can consistently, you know, make happen. Um, so maybe we'll stay tuned for more to come on that. Um, all right, so as we're kind of getting towards the end of this, um, uh, implementing a, a whole protocol for these pieces is going to certainly involve evaluating the existing policies in your facility. You know, what are we currently doing? If we're already doing skin to skin after vaginal deliveries, you know, what do we need to do to make that happen after cesarean births? Um, what about this cord clamping? You know, who's, um, who's anxious about it, you know, or nervous about it? If we're not doing that, what do we need to do to uh, get everybody on board? Which, of course, then leads to the next point of get all of your stakeholders involved. Um, and that's certainly going to be a multidisciplinary group of people. So, you know, it could be your, your OBs and family medicine physicians, peds, of course, but anesthesia, if we want to do some of these things in the OR, um, nursing staff, um, and, the, um, and we'll talk about, you know, some others here in a minute, I think. So, uh, you might want to address, um, are there points in time where we might need another uh, staff nurse or someone available for a period of time? that we need to, you know, plan for, um, can we, how do we reduce interruption in the first hour? So we want to put something about that um, in the protocol so we don't have so many um, either family members or staff that are coming in and, and possibly interrupting this special time period. And, uh, of course, then implementing any kind of changes like this is going to lead to, um, needing training for both um, nursing staff, physicians, and any other um, affected or impacted healthcare providers. So, um, and last but not least is once you kind of get all of your um, uh, protocol policies in place, then, uh, then do some pilot testing. PDSA, y'all have heard us talk about PDSAs before, plan, do, study, act. Um, get get your, your people that are your innovators, your people that are eager to make this happen, and you know, identify you know, your first couple of patients that you're going to test it out on and see what works um, and see what didn't work and then what do you need to change. So um, always a good way to uh, test out something new. So some of the um, common barriers uh, that were discussed, um, certainly kind of some internal or facility barriers, uh, just resistance to change, as you all know. Um, you know, is this going to change my workflow, my routine? Um, you know, or we talked about the weight already. You know, well, how do we admit the baby uh, if we don't have a weight? And how do we get, you know, the baby's, you know, meds and vaccinations and so forth that we need if we can't admit them? And so do we have to have pharmacy involved um, in uh, implementing some of these changes? Uh, and, you know, is this a facility where we've always done immediate cord clamping or we've always done early bathing? And, you know, how hard is it going to be to uh, change, change those um, really hard work practices? Um, and do we still have people that, you know, or staff or that perceive, you know, that the baby is safer under the warmer than on the mother's chest? Hopefully that's becoming um, a more uncommon barrier. I would hope. Um, and, uh, you know, staffing ratios. Do we, you know, are we pretty short staffed and it's a really difficult time to try to initiate any kind of, you know, big practice change like this? Um, and then last but not least is just lack of knowledge uh, on everyone's part about the importance of the golden hour. 
uh, for both the baby and the mother. So, um, so definitely training um, needs to be involved. So we can have barriers, as y'all mentioned, um, from the mothers from, and the families. So moms may be anxious about um, having a baby skin to skin and thinking she's going to be laying there naked while all these people are coming in. Of course, we've done that already during delivery, but <laughs> um, it's a little different now that the baby's here. Um, so how do we address um, modesty, privacy concerns for the mother? Um, of course, we have to educate the rest of the family about how important this time is and that they can hold the baby later. Uh, and then interruptions by hospital staff. Um, so um, the authors uh, in this uh, cited, of course, um, some different studies, but there was one um, you know, they, in this that they said, um, new mothers really viewed all the frequent interruptions as exhausting, stressful, and detrimental uh, to bonding with their babies. So uh, that was really uh, eye-opening to me. Um, sometimes something I think um, you know we certainly need to pay attention to. So um, we can also look at implementing um, a protocol like this and the impact on both um, you know financial. You know how much is this going to cost us? And then what about quality measures? So um, implementation cost. Other than maybe, you know, if, if there's elements of the protocol that require having another nurse available for a short period of time, that's probably, you know, uh, one of your more expensive pieces. But ultimately, um, you need some uh, IT support if you're, you know, how are you documenting or what about, you know, working with pharmacy and admitting the baby and so forth, um, creating new educational materials and doing that staff training. Those are probably you know, your biggest cost to implementing these practices. Um, but we also need to keep in mind with the way healthcare is going and this emphasis on value based healthcare or managed care bundles. So the mother's coming in and her whole uh, labor and delivery and newborn care is, is a managed care bundle. And if we can decrease internal cost, um, that the hospital may no longer get reimbursed for. What if that baby develops jaundice and stays longer? You know, well, if we can reduce the possibility of that and decrease the length of stay, uh, or decrease, of course, even special care nursery admissions for some of these babies, that's going to benefit the hospital. Um, and last but not least, of course, is increased patient satisfaction. So, um, and this was, I think, citing again the. I think this was the Bureau um, study out of Australia um, that uh, found that there was significantly increased maternal satisfaction when the mothers, you know, got to hold their newborns, you know, earlier, uh, certainly immediately, and then for longer periods of time. So um, definitely impact on patient satisfaction. So I'm going to pause here and see if um, that's kind of the end of the big information on that. Any any questions or comments from anyone? Um, things that you found? Um, any other uh, maybe challenges you've encountered that I didn't mention? All is quiet in <laughs> Cyberland. Um, mm -hmm. So. Um, I have one more slide just to give you um, to uh, change gears here, but certainly, if, yeah, if anybody's thinking of any other questions or comments, um, feel free to, uh, uh, yeah, to pipe up. But just uh, as a reminder, um, of course, you know, we have Sarah on, and she's going to help us with getting some things uh, fixed on our website that uh, we haven't had um, enough people to manage uh, in the past few months, at least. But I'm going to actually see if this will, yeah. So um, just to let everybody know, because um, when you look at uh, training for your physicians, um, oh, yay. <laughs> um, we now actually have um, three uh, different links, and these are all free trainings that uh, you can uh, um, encourage your physicians uh, to take or uh, assign to them, depending on the relationship there. The newest one is this one from the Maryland Department of Health. I'm going to click on that and show you. And there's a whole webinar series, and all of these are presentations by um, 
different physicians. Some of you may know Lori Feldman Winter. Um, she's we've had her here to speak at our summit um, in years past. Here we've got one on breastfeeding and tight frenulums, immunology, and so forth. So definitely some good um, uh, information there. Let me whoops go back. Here we go. Um, this one from the University of Albany um, is one we'd had um, posted previously, but it's a, um, oh, I think it was a four CME. Yeah, there's four different uh, modules here, prenatal care, couple on hospital, and then the um, early postpartum care. So that's um, also a good one. And then um, this is a three hour CME um, that, uh, um, is also available so and had you know uh, support from the American Academy of Pediatrics and Massachusetts Department of Health so all of these would be quality um, trainings that we just wanted to make sure y'all are aware of because that is always a question of what is good um, information for a, uh, or good education that you can use for um, getting your physicians uh, up to speed on all things breastfeeding as well so um, all right. Well, I will, um, yeah, go back to just see one more time if anybody has any questions or comments uh, or any other thoughts. Um, and all, as always, um, if there's a particular um, topic that you would like to see addressed um, on a webinar, um, we are always open to um, suggestions because we want these to be pertinent and useful uh, for the work that you're doing. So definitely give us uh, feedback on that. So I'm going to stop talking for a minute and see. Um, Petra, do you have any other announcements or anything to make? Or do you make um, oh, right, right. I can say um, Petra's reminding me um, that uh, our o Oklahoma Lactation Consultant Association, in conjunction with the U.S. Um, LCA, is uh, hosting a one-day um, breastfeeding uh, regional conference here on June 8th, a Friday, right? Um, it'll be it'll be here on the Oklahoma uh, Oklahoma City Health the Oklahoma Health Science Center campus in Oklahoma City uh, in the uh, Samus uh, Auditorium that many of you have been yeah, to before. So. At it. <laughs> oh, and I'm speaking it. That's right. <laughs> I better know where it is, and I better have it on my calendar. <laughs> So, um, so anyway, so that should be a good day as well. Um, all right. Well, if I don't hear any, yeah, I don't see any other, let me see if I see any other questions in the chat box. Um, all right. Then um, it never hurts to end a little bit early. And um, uh, it's going to get cold again this weekend. It should be our free state, but it's. <laughs> We're going to go down to the wire on that, aren't we? So um, anyway, I'll let everybody go and um, have a good rest of your week. And thanks for joining in today. Thank you. All righty. Thank you all. You just made us really upset. But <laughs> <laughs> I'm like,